the KGB who they were and what they did. The KGB was the chief government intelligence and security agency of the Soviet Union from 1954 until its collapse in 1991. The Soviet Union was made up of 15 republics, Russia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Belarusia, Estonia, Georgia, Kyrgyzia, Latvia, Lithuania, Moldavia, Tajikistan, Turkmenia, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, and Uzbekistan. In some republics, the KGB didn't operate directly, but there were similar organizations that carried out the same tasks. The KGB consisted of two parts, intelligence services and military units that were totally separate from the Soviet armed forces. They operated as a completely independent government agency. And although the KGB marketed itself as the intelligence agency of the USSR, it was also a form of secret police, ensuring citizens all across the Republic stayed in line with Soviet ideals, and political dissidence was dealt with quietly and often fatally. KGB stands for Komitet Gosudarstvenoi Bezopasnosti, which translates to Committee for State Security in English. The most famous former KGB agent alive today is Russian President Vladimir Putin. In March 1954, the KGB replaced the existing MVD that had been in place the previous year and had such well-informed and successful agents of espionage that Joseph Stalin knew far less about his own agents than those working for the UK and the US. Over the course of the war and beyond, Soviet intelligence agencies had thousands of international spies operating in dozens of countries and at one point was the largest institution of its kind. But at home, they were uncomfortably compared to Germany's World War II secret police, the Gestapo. Political dissidents, those who spoke out about anti-communist ideals or against the government, frequently found their homes invaded and themselves arrested, at best. As the world headed into the Cold War, this only intensified with the KGB, monitoring both private and public opinions of Soviet citizens at home. After the war, waves of anti-communist sentiment spread throughout the West, heightening the tensions of the hardening Cold War between the Soviets, Europeans, and Americans. This was called the Second Red Scare, the first that occurred decades earlier between 1917 and 1920, and before the creation of the KGB. During this period, the Americans became aware of the volume of Soviet spies across the U.S. living both legally and illegally. They feared what these spies would do to their society and political ideals. This was a particular fear of Senator Joseph McCarthy, who spearheaded investigations that led to hundreds of accusations of treason and subversion. It's impossible to know the true number of victims of McCarthy's fanatical approach to rooting out Russian spies, but estimates place the number of those imprisoned in the hundreds, and it's predicted over 10,000 lost their jobs as a result of being questioned. Subsequently, over the course of the early 1950s, the number of Soviet spies across America dropped dramatically with the last major illegal spy, Rudolf Abel, being betrayed by his assistant in 1957. Nevertheless, at home, the KGB continued to tighten the reins on Soviet society. In the 1960s, due to a U.S. political dissident, John Anthony Walker, Soviet intelligence was able to decipher thousands of U.S. Navy messages, giving them a decisive military edge, should they choose to act upon it. The Hungarian Revolution of 1956 began with a protest by university students against the USSR, as well as their hardline Stalinist former head of state, Matyas Rakosi. Prague Spring began in 1969, when Czechoslovakia tried to assert its independence from the USSR by reclaiming political power back into its member state. On both occasions, the Red Army of the USSR was quick to act, invading the countries and shooting thousands of protesters and civilians to quell the uprising. As usual, the KGB quickly and quietly worked alongside the Red Army and USSR's other operatives to destabilize the revolutions. In Czechoslovakia, they infiltrated pro-democratic institutions to undermine political sentiments and reported back to the Soviet government. On October 29, 1956, in Hungary, a report by chief of the KGB, Ivan Serov, claimed inaccurately that armed groups were seeking out communists and killing them, as well as any state security officials they found. 
The Hungarian military leader, Paul Melita, responded by negotiating a diplomatic meeting between a Hungarian delegation and the USSR. During the midnight of that same evening, Serov ordered the arrest of the Hungarian delegation. The following day, after the removal of their leader by the KGB, the Soviet army attacked Hungary again. The uprising was quelled just seven days later, officially ending on November 11, 1956. After the uprising was over, Serov and the KGB continued to monitor Hungary closely, once again employing tactics to monitor any internal dissidents. By 1964, the head of the USSR, Nikita Khrushchev, had fallen out of political favor. He had denounced Stalin years earlier, a shocking move to the USSR, and had moved to eradicate Stalin's policies. This, coupled with his later handling of the Cuban Missile Crisis, led to other government officials and the KGB chief, Vladimir Simichesny, to plot his removal. Unlike most former heads of the USSR, Khrushchev did not meet an unfortunate end. On October 13th, when he landed at Vnukovo Airport, he was met by Semichesny and other heads of the coup, who took him to the Kremlin, with little resistance from Khrushchev himself. 24 hours later, the premier announced his allegedly voluntary removal from power. He spent the rest of his life in a house paid for and monitored by the KGB, who recorded his every word and all visitors who came to his house. Khrushchev spent his last years writing memoirs that the KGB tried desperately to get their hands on. In 1970, after he was hospitalized, the agency instead went after his son, who finally handed over his father's original memoir notes, having already successfully smuggled copies to a Western publisher, much to the KGB's dismay. In the 1970s, the KGB became more heavily involved in South Asia. They influenced political opinion across newly formed Bangladesh, starting in 1973 with the installment of the first president, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. Initially democratic, just two years later, Mujibur formed a one-party state. The KGB's influence grew exponentially across the rest of the 70s, despite Mujibur's own reign coming to an abrupt end six months later, when he and most of his family were assassinated during a coup. This didn't slow down KGB influence in Bangladesh, however. By the end of the decade, the number of officials in the area had more than doubled, and they had printed numerous defamatory news articles targeting the newly appointed and West-friendly de facto president, Zia Rahman. The KGB were heavily involved in Afghanistan in the late 1970s. They had heavily influenced political leadership in the country and sought to control it by placing a puppet president in the leadership role. But they were thwarted when the second president, Hafizullah Amin, took control of the country. They found themselves less able to control and influence his leadership. He wrote memos in English and spoke regularly with the United States. Eventually, the KGB claimed he was an American spy and undertook the successful operation of Storm 333, where they assassinated Amin. Their actions marked the start of the Soviet-Afghan War. In 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed. Over the preceding years, the states had become looser republics, eventually culminating in the complete dissolution of the Union, much to the distaste of the KGB. In August 1991, the chairman of the KGB, Vladimir Khrushchev, launched a coup against Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev, alongside other Soviet leaders. Their intention was to re-centralize Soviet power in Russia, removing the increased liberties that had been given to the Soviet states. Ultimately, two days later, they failed, and it marked the final end stages of the complete dissolution of the Soviet Union and the KGB themselves. Russia's Federal Security Service Throughout the world, there are many national policing agencies designed to root out criminals, provide internal security, or uphold the will of the regime. Few, however, have as long or complex history as Russia's Federal Security Service. 
Secret state policing is nothing new to Russia, having its origins as far back as the 16th century with the establishment of the Oprichniki under Ivan the Terrible. In the late 19th and 20th centuries, the Okhranoi Odilinai was established to suppress any perceived agitators in the latter days of Tsarist rule. The current Federal Security Service can trace its lineage to the Bolshevik Revolution in the aftermath of the overthrow of the Tsarist regime. In 1917, Communist leader Vladimir Lenin established the Cheka, a secret policing force with the mandate to monitor and suppress counter-revolutionary activities, focusing on enemies of the state, such as clergy and former nobility. After the formation of the Soviet Union in 1922, the Cheka was replaced by the GPU, or State Political Administration, renamed to the OGPU, or Unified State Political Administration. A year later, though, agents of internal security were still often referred to as Czechist, a label that persists even today. Like its predecessors, the OGPU was responsible for arresting enemies of the regime, as well as overseeing the collectivization of farms and overseeing the earliest of Soviet gulags, or forced labor camps. In order to keep dissidents in check, the OGPU had total control over internal security for the Soviet Union, which included placing an army of informants in Communist Party functions, the Red Army, factories, farms, and anywhere else enemies of the state could potentially be found. In 1934, as an attempt of Joseph Stalin to consolidate power, the OGPU was transformed yet again into the GUGB, or Main Administration of State Security, and integrated into the newly formed security apparatus, the NKVD, the People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs. The GUGB, as part of the NKVD, played a pivotal role in the Great Purge, which saw the execution or imprisonment of hundreds of thousands of military personnel party officials, and other supposed dissidents. In 1938, leadership of the NKVD would be taken over by the infamous Lavrenti Beria. In 1941, the NKGB was formed, separating state security from foreign intelligence, a split which was formalized in 1943, though Beria remained the leader of both foreign and internal security. During the Second World War, the NKGB played a major role in supporting the Soviet war effort, administering prison camps, conducted extensive intelligence and counterintelligence operations, and monitored the Red Army for disloyalty to the regime. In 1946, the NKGB was once again reorganized, becoming known as the Ministry of State Security, or MGB. Shortly after the death of Joseph Stalin in 1953, the MGB was once again merged with the Ministry of Internal Affairs, or MVD, still under the control of Beria. In the scramble for power after the dictator's death, Beria would be imprisoned and executed. In the following years, the extensive prison labor system would release millions of political prisoners, and the MGB would be dismantled. Even as the MGB and other security forces were being eliminated in the post-Stalin reforms, there was still a clear need for intelligence and internal policing within the Soviet Union. In 1954, the KGB was created, with its stated mission to act as the sword and shield of the Communist Party. Throughout the Cold War, the KGB was actively involved in foreign intelligence gathering, a direct parallel to the American CIA and British MI6. Though it also was heavily involved in internal policing, once again being used to monitor Soviet citizens for disloyalty, treason, or any activity deemed a threat to the Communist Party. In 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed, and with it, the KGB as well. Much like the nation it served, the KGB was split into several different organizations, based on national lines. In Russia, the task of international intelligence gathering was taken up by the SVR. Internal policing would be handled first by the Federal Service for Counterintelligence, or FSK, until it was reorganized in 1995 to the Federal Security Service, or FSB. In 1998, former KGB operative Vladimir Putin was appointed head of the FSB by Russian President Boris Yeltsin. Since his ascension to leader of Russia in 2000, two men have headed the agency, both considered to be close allies of Putin. 
The FSB is located at the former headquarters of the KGB at Lubyanka Square, a short walk from Red Square. The head of the Federal Security Service, currently Alexander Bortnikov, is appointed by and directly answers to President Putin. As a former espionage officer, Putin has placed a tremendous emphasis on intelligence gathering since his ascension to power and has poured vast resources into the FSB, making it the largest security service in Europe. Even before becoming leader of Russia, Putin identified foreign espionage as the greatest threat facing Russia and has taken steps to counter it. Like its KGB predecessor, one of the primary tasks of the Federal Security Service is monitoring foreign nationals living in Russia, with emphasis placed on diplomats and others working at embassies. American personnel working at the embassy in Moscow were constantly watched for any signs of espionage, and diplomats and others working there soon learned to control their private conversations, as locally hired staff often reported to the FSB. Even outside the embassy grounds, FSB agents would keep close tabs on their foreign charges, following them into museums, restaurants, and train stations, lest they actually be CIA agents passing along sensitive information. This occasionally led to humorous incidents, where the FSB officers would reveal themselves. In one instance, reminding an American CIA officer that he was about to miss his train, and would be stuck outside of Moscow if he didn't hurry to the station. On another occasion, the surveillance team prevented an American official from being mugged on the street, chasing off the criminals. While the FSB does concern itself with dealing with foreigners, the priority of the organization is devoted to policing the Russian population. Particular emphasis is placed on monitoring the military, with at least one operative attached to each regiment in peacetime, and one per battalion during war, though this number can increase as deemed appropriate. Once in place, the agent gathers informants, drawn from the soldiers themselves, but also support staff, civilians living in the area, and even family members of the soldiers. The FSB can be heavy-handed when dealing with those deemed a threat to the regime. In 2006, FSB defector Alexander Litvinenko was living in London when he suddenly fell ill. After extensive testing, it was discovered that he was poisoned by polonium, a rare radioactive element. All evidence points to the FSB and the Russian government government ordering the assassination, as usable amounts of polonium can only be produced through extensive nuclear programs, something only a national government would have access to. The assassination was made possible due to a law passed earlier that year which allowed FSB operatives to eliminate terrorists and other extremists in foreign countries. Another possible target of the Federal Security Service include Anna Stepanova Politkovskaya, a journalist and critic of the Putin regime. She was found shot in her apartment in 2006, and scrutiny fell on the FSB for their possible involvement. Politkovskaya was allegedly preparing to release a scathing report against Chechnya's leader and Putin ally Khramzan Akhmadovich Kadyrov for human rights abuses when she was killed. In addition to espionage, the FSB also plays a major role in counterterrorism operations, particularly against regions in the northern Caucasus, such as Dagestan and Chechnya, having focused on the region since the late 1990s. In September 1999, Chechnyan terrorists attacked apartment buildings in Russia, killing over 200 people, provoking the first Chechnyan war, though Litvinenko claimed that this was a false flag operation led by the FSB, designed to justify the conflict. Conflict. Like their espionage, the Federal Security Service can be heavy-handed in their approach to dealing with terrorism, using direct force as opposed to subtle tactics to achieve their goals. In 2002, Chechen terrorists held some 850 people hostage at the Duprovka Theater in Moscow. The FSB pumped in knockout gas into the building before storming in. Though they were successful in eliminating the 40 hostage takers, over 130 of the hostages died, only five at the hands of the terrorists the rest succumbing to the gas or caught in the crossfire. Similarly, in 2004, the FSB was called in to end the three-day Beslan school siege and stormed the building. The assaulting agents utilized overwhelming firepower, such as heavy machine guns, grenade launchers, and even a tank's main cannon were used. As a result, over 330 people were killed, including 180 children, one of the worst school shootings in world history.
State policing has a long history in Russia, and the Federal Security Service is the latest in a long line of organizations willing to perform the bidding of Russia's leadership.